Hello viewers, so welcome all to this today's podcast on endometrial scratch. I am Dr. Maruf Siddiqui, ASPA board member and moderator for this episode of podcast. Uh, so we all know that uh, endometrial scratching, the fertility specialists, they have been using this endometrial scratch uh, for many years, uh, trying to increase the chances of their pregnancy in the IVF cycles. So uh, initially we were, we used to do it in using a biopsy pipette and then hysteroscopy came on and now we are all doing it hysteroscopically. So initially the results were very promising, but as the days goes by, it is becoming more and more controversial in different aspects. So uh, to discuss this uh, very interesting thing today, we have our Dr. Mohan Kamath as our guest speaker, and he's a very eminent person currently working as the professor and head of reproductive medicine and surgery, CMC Velour. So uh, welcome to our show, Dr. Mohan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maruf. Okay. So hope you're doing well. Uh, let's start with the very basic things. So yeah. uh, what are the possible mechanisms uh, nowadays? What are the possible mechanisms uh, in, in, through which this endometrial scratch may help? in increasing the chances of pregnancies before the IVF cycles? Yeah, so um, there are actually, uh, when it was introduced, uh, there were three, uh, at least a couple of them, or approximately three mechanisms proposed. Uh, so first one, of course, was that uh, there is a school of thought which believes that ovarian stimulation uh, leads to adva um, advancement of endometrium, you know, and uh, scratch would in some ways delay that and you'll have more synchronous uh, uh, environment for implantation. Then, of course, there was one more um, uh, mechanism that was proposed is uh, in a rodent models, actually, uh, if you introduce a foreign uh, object in the uterine cavity, it leads to decidalization. And that is something what they thought would be happening in uh, humans as well. But uh, of course, critics have uh, not been in agreement with this because uh, the human decidalization is mainly hormone induced and not uh, they can mean uh, you know induce decidalization. Of course, there were others who believed that it would lead to favorable cytokine uh, uh, and uh, interleukin and T helper C cells uh, building up and creating a favorable implantation. So these were the biological uh, mechanisms proposed, but nothing was concrete uh, proven that this is what was helping. Uh, and if you ask me uh, personally, just as a clinician, I think it is just the, the instrumentation and, uh, you know, uh, dilating the cervix, ease of transfer was probably the most simplest of reasons why it would work in certain subsets of patients. Yeah, that's what I would think. Yeah, exactly. So maybe cytokines and other chemical parameters, they have a role, but... Clinically, it's the scratching or maybe the stimulating the endometrium that may have a good effect in the subsequent pregnancies. Yeah, I might just add here because this is why this one, the scratch, the hysteroscopy or a dilatation, they kind of work through the same mechanism, you know. So that's why there's been overlap of evidence between hysteroscopy and scratch, you know. People, of course, you mentioned that you end up doing a hysteroscopy, always do a scratch, uh, you know, just to see that. But it's just that I think the possible common pathways of doing an embryo transfer subsequently. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you. So, so uh, may we know what was the initial studies? What was the suggestion from the initial studies? Yeah, so for me, this, this scratch journey has been quite interesting because it is kind of, uh, it takes you through the ups and downs of evidence uh, evolution, the way I look at it. It's a classic example where, you know, uh, we've had so much of learning how difficult it is to prove something is working or not is, I think endometrial scratch is a prototype for that. That's what I, I, I always follow the, the topic very carefully because there are always new studies coming up. So the, it all began, I think, uh, almost two decades back. Uh, and uh, it's in 2003 to, uh, where the paper came from Barash and his group. Uh, which uh, proposed that it actually increased live birth rate, almost doubling it. 
which is quite a big thing, 22% uh, to going up to 49%. And I think uh, it was too good to be true, but then people believed. And uh, the main uh, thing that was appealing was that it was uh, a, a very simple procedure and most of us fertility specialists felt that uh, it won't be very difficult doing this and patient also would not be really inconvenienced. So that's why it was quite widespread because it's relatively a simple procedure, though it is invasive. Um, and that's where it started. And then there, have, there were some uh, trials. Uh, I think uh, between 2007 and 9, there were small trials, uh, not published in very high impact factor journals. And they also um, uh, pointed out that this endometrial scratch is working. But the point to note here was slowly the, the population in these trials were quite different. Some of them had, um, at that point, recurrent implantation failure population. Then somebody used it for one failure. So this was uh, you know emerging. So people were thinking it might work in a different population and they were trying to plan their trials accordingly. So this was up to 2010. And I would take one step further at this point. And by the time it became like 2012 and 13, we had a couple of systematic reviews coming in and they started collating these studies. And uh, because they were small trials and some of them were observational studies, they went on and pooled these studies and kind of gave a pool result showing that it is beneficial. So a decade into introduction of endometrial scratch, by the time it was 2012 and 13, uh, we reached a point where quite a that this is working and the evidence the way it was presented uh the systematic reviews there's one published in rbm online uh, as well uh which which pool these two or three randomized trial and couple of observation studies and suggested that it is beneficial so these were the initial uh a decade of endometrial scratch if you call it yeah yeah Exactly. In fact, uh, we, the IVF specialists, always uh, found it difficult. How print is the pregnancy rate? So actually, when something new comes in, we all go through this, let's try it, let's try if we can increase the pregnancy rates. And the initial studies were really, really encouraging. But as the evidence uh, uh, come, starts to come, it, uh, it's, it is really becoming more and more controversial. So uh, now, uh, I think uh, more than two decades have already passed. We have been doing the endometrial yeah. scratch. So what do you suggest? What do the subsequent strategies uh, suggested or what is the evidence now? Yeah, so the way I look at it, the pendulum started shifting uh, a decade later. So as it happens, it could be a reason uh, we could think about publication bias where the editors were now tired of seeing only the positive studies and they started encouraging the negatives. So there was one big trial published in uh, uh, which had uh, also uh, reported and they did not find any benefit of uh, endometrial scratch. But as I said, people included unselected population, first IVF, somebody selected RIF and all. So there was still heterogeneity in the population. Uh, but again, uh, these were the trials which started showing no effect. So this was a decade later. But I think the controversial um, uh, part started when the Cochrane review came in 2015, uh, an update. Uh, and that um, actually suggested it was a moderate quality evidence, uh, which suggested improvement in live birth or clinical pregnancy, which was a big uh, surprise. And they did mention that I think they had something like 15 to 16 trials, but eight, seven or eight of them had a high risk of bias. But having said that, uh, this Cochrane ended up saying that it's a moderate quality evidence supporting endometrial scratch, which was quite uh, controversial. And uh, I, I must add here that that, um, that led to a lot of changes in the methodology for Cochrane reviews in some ways. Um, what was happening was there was growing worry uh, that we were getting very problematic trials or some of them with high risk of bias trials and we are pooling them together and coming up with uh, pooled results which might not be very close to the truth and uh, and it was impacting practice. So for this there was controversy and I think there were a couple of papers in human reproduction as well 
which started analyzing these systematic reviews itself. And they said that they have included very problematic trials or, and uh, then they proposed that we need to relook at this thing. So I think this is where um, there was some uh, issues, methodological and people had a relook. And if I may continue here, um, I think just to add on the same uh, you know, flow, that finally what happened was Cochrane um, did start pooling uh, in the primary analysis, they only presented trials with low risk of bias. And this is what is reflected in the 2021 update uh, of Cochrane, uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah Lenson and group, which actually uh, just presented the results from low risk of bias and not very commonly, you will see an Cochrane update changing the other way. Mm. It just said that uh, there is uh, uncertainty about endometrial scratch and uh, it no longer recommended it. Mm. And uh, that's where I think the whole thing shifted. So it, it's come till here, uh, but of course uh, we can discuss this and then I'll have some more newer trials we can discuss as well. Exactly. Actually, the Cochrane, I think they uh, they found that the trials were not homogeneous and there were lack of standardization regarding the intensity of the scratch, the timing of the scratch, the duration of the scratch, and so many things. Some people were using the pipette, some were using hysteroscopy, and it yeah. was uh, very difficult. And, uh, and like you said, that the, in the 2018 ASHRAE, uh, yeah, Sarah and the group they did not recommend. They said well, it's better we might to st just stop it, doing it because yeah. statistically there was no significant difference significant. in the life birth rates between the and the scratch and the uh, no scratch group. Yeah. So so the whatever so uh, after the controversy, what are we to what do we stand today now in terms of evidence? Yeah. So I think the credit, of course, uh, some of the groups like Sarah Langston and many others actually after this there was some three or four big trials. And that kind of uh, was very informative. So Sarah Lenson's group, where, which published a PIP trial, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, was a classic trial where they got 26% on both sides, live birth. So that kind of, but again, they used unselected population. They had a mix of RIF as well. And then it slowly started building up. Then there was a scratch trial, which included, I think, a uh, woman with one failure only. Uh, which also uh, was not significantly better in terms, but there was some suggestion, but it was not significant that the, there was improvement. But um, then there was a refresh trial, which apparently did the endometrial scratch in the same cycle. And they had uh, worryingly lower, uh, higher miscarriage rates following endometrial scratch, which they had to stop the trial. Um, that's what it was. And I think the final uh, word is still not out because what has happened is the scratch trial authors, um, they have actually gone ahead and published uh, individualized participant data meta-analysis, the IPD meta-analysis, which came last year. And we were, of course, a part of it, um, which actually pooled, uh, we had almost 50 trials, but um, some 12 or 13 of them actually uh, gave their data for this IPD review. And they uh, finally uh, came up, um, uh, they had a slightly significant uh, in favor of endometrial scratch. So uh, the dilemma now is you have an, a published paper in IPD metastasis showing slight benefit on odds ratio 1.2 uh, 1 in favor of endometrial scratch and a Cochrane saying that it's not working. Um, so. This is where it is. The controversy hasn't died down uh, to me. So this is the evidence. And of course, now we can take up where we want to in terms of what to do as a clinician. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Kamath, uh, many people agreed that uh, it's controversial whether you should go for an endometrial scratch. But uh, uh, many people are now in consensus that maybe it is useful for in case of recurrent implantation failures. There are evidences that it, it is quite beneficial in that aspect. So what yeah. is your comment about that? So if we are, um, uh, we, we, of course, we'll summarize uh, just before closing off. But uh, in RIF, again, there's been again a controversy with the definition itself. 
and all that a lot of people now with the PGT on, we know that there is very few patients actually who are RIF because most of the problem is in the embryo. You know, so if if we are we are doing scratch, we are just trying to promote endometrial receptivity, whereas most of the times the embryo is uh, not euploid. So exactly. unless you are convinced that you have euploid or you have put enough number of unselected blastocysts, then only we identify this group of patients and probably offer them this, especially I would say in patients where we didn't have a very smooth transfer, embryo transfer. You know, this is where I would think that lady would probably would have, you know, uh, may benefit. And we should be very clear with the patient that we are not very sure yet, but may benefit you if this is what it is, you know, at this point. Okay, so I think uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. So yeah. maybe uh, the take home message should be like that, that initially it was very exciting for all of us and we yeah. had very good results. But uh, as the results uh, begin to come, uh, it is becoming more and more controversial nowadays. And so yeah. still we are in a dilemma whether to go for a scratching or not go for a scratching. So maybe it's a clinician's choice. So what yeah. do you think as a clinician in your clinical practice, uh, what is your suggestion? Which group of patients would you offer in the scratch or would you not offer it at all? Yeah, so I would probably, first thing I would say that uh, it should not be offered routinely for all IVF uh, women uh, people. That's very clear. Exactly. Probably for one failure, I would not think about it again. And then when you have a subset of uh, patients who are having repeated failures and we are convinced that it is not the embryo, but it is more towards the receptivity, uh, this is probably subset of RIF patients. You can think about this intervention, especially if you are feeling that you've had a couple of difficult embryo transfers. Uh, and if at all you're offering this, I would suggest not to offer it in the same cycle, but in the preceding cycle. Uh, that would be my uh, you know, final comments on this. Exactly. So, uh, so the current evidence is that uh, if you want to use it, maybe go for the previous cycle, do a hysteroscope, but still yeah. there are controversies regarding the duration, regarding the intensity of the scratch, and just hope it will work better, you know, patient. So yeah. the controversy goes on and maybe in near future, we will discuss it again with uh, some yes. more controversies. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kamath, for giving us your valuable time. And we hope to uh, meet you again in some other podcasts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, viewers.